a PhD, then did a PhD in still physics at the Ecole Normale Supérieure with Vincent Hakim before doing a postdoc with Eric Sigia at Rockefeller University. And this work has really been continuing as far as I can tell from the, the many papers that Paul has written over the last few years. He's been at McGill since 2010 and really done some of the nicest work combining passions such as developmental biology and non-equilibrium thermodynamics, statistical mechanics. And I invite you, Paul, now to take the floor about your work. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation. Uh, and I would also like to uh, offer you my condolences for uh, the sad loss of uh, a month. Uh, it's, it's very shocking. And, uh, you know, I, I did not know him, I did not interact with him, but I, I, I saw his work and I found that very interesting and fascinating. So uh, I'm not going to move to my, my actual talk. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so, uh, and I'm going to put my timer just so that I am in time with everybody. Uh, so uh, today uh, I will tell you about some very recent work uh, the, on you know kind of a global theme that we have been exploring over the last uh, two three years I would say, and I, I call that biophysics in latent space. And before I, I actually present, uh, give you details about this, I, I want to motivate a bit. Uh, why we're doing this and what this means. And I would like to start with an ideal world situation where uh, you know you would have maybe high throughput experimental method. Uh, and then from that you would uh, you would get uh, some you know data uh, uh, such as this U map or uh, this uh, this uh, this kind of uh, you know this big network of interaction. And then maybe uh, you, what you would like to do is to use machine learning or mathematical modeling to do something, uh, get predictions, get principles. But uh, as you know, uh, as many of you know, as theorists, uh, there is really uh, there are really some problems here. So you know, how do we go from uh, the data to the math is really a big issue. And so, and there have been many issues over the years. So when I was a PhD student and, and still to this day, one of the big issue is that you have a lot of complication complexity in biology. So that's what I call the connectionist nightmare. Uh, you know, this is a, here you don't really see probably, but that's a network of interaction uh, in immunology. And you see how complicated it is that will give rise to many equations. And then as your theorists, physicists, mathematicians, it's Really difficult to deal with those all those equations. And then sometimes it leads to some issues. So for instance, if you want to fit data, uh, well, you know also that you know any complicated model can pretty much fit anything. So if you can predict anything, uh, you predict nothing. So it's really difficult to deal with this kind of complexity. Uh, now, those days we have other way, other ways to deal with that, such as machine learning. Uh, and so, you know, you've seen uh, obviously uh, this kind of U map uh, on biological data. Uh, but then, one of the issues, for instance, is that with U map, you know, if you change a bit uh, the hyperparameters of the U map, you could get very different maps. And so the topology is going to change. Uh, so these 2D projections are not really easy to interpret. Uh, another problem is that in biology, you have time. You know, many, many systems in biology are dynamical by, by sense. And so, uh, and I will show you a typical example of this today. And so how do you deal with a 2D projection of data in time? So that's really an issue. And then the last issue I want to point out, and uh, is this is really about what is the way to think about data and what, is the, what are the right variables to consider. And so I like this example of UMAP 3D. If you do a UMAP 3D of a, of a parrot, and then you do UMAP 2D, you really don't recognize a parrot at all. And uh, I like to make this analogy with physics, where depending on the variable you consider, you might get a very simple model like heliocentri heliocentrism. But you know, if you changing your frame of reference, then you get something that is quite nice too, but much more complicated to describe. And so finding the right variables is really complicated. And, and, and that's really one of the issue of the machine with machine learning. And so uh, with this in mind, 
Uh, I would like to tell you about some work we've been doing to somehow try to solve those issues and, and, and basically uh, deal, uh, especially with this machine learning uh, and, and uh, you know, problems. And so uh, if I were to describe our general approach over the year, I, I, I can find a, a common thread, which is uh, the following. So one thing we did systematically is that I like to reduce dimensionality of, of the systems. And uh, you would say in the machine learning world that we do it in a supervised way. And so, and the way we do it is by using biological knowledge. And I will show you examples of what I mean by this. Uh, but it's really crucial for me to understand things in a low dimensional space and it's what I call latent space. Now, once you understand the problem in latent space, uh, you can do a lot uh, in a low dimensional space. And so you can actually do modeling and model dynamics. You can even sometimes prove actual theorems in latent space. So we've done that a little bit. Uh, and then once you have looked and projected your, 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 your system in 2D or 3D and then uh, describe the dynamic there and prove result there, then you will move back to the you know, higher uh, level complexity and try to see you know, how the, the small dimensional problem looks different from the high dimensional problem. And so again, that's the common trend that I've been using in my research over the years. And today I would like to tell you about two uh, problems uh, that I've been interested in, uh, like giving rise to two papers. One is published and the other is, uh, is going to be submitted very soon. So first I'm going to tell you about our approach uh, of what we call geometric models for a system called metazoan segmentation. So metazoan segmentation is, for instance, vertebrae formation uh, in vertebrates. And so I would say that this problem was really more like question driven. Uh, and uh, we try to apply a few theoretical, nice theoretical tools developed over the year uh, to really get a good understanding of uh, such developmental system. And then recently, uh, I got more interested, I mean, not more interested, I got interested into immunology. And, uh, and in immunology, uh, uh, we try to do something a bit different. I would qualify this you know, not so much question driven, but maybe more data driven, how you build a model, a low dimensional model of data you don't quite know how to deal with. And so we got an interesting result of something that we call anti-gene encoding. And so my talk will be really like kind of two independent parts like that, uh, but I hope you will see the connection and, and that you will realize that you know, the tools uh, are really kind of the same. So uh, with this, I'm going to start with my, my, my developmental uh, talk, basically. And so uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, vertebrae formation or segmentation. And so uh, one thing that is very striking uh, in evolutions, uh, in evolution, when you compare animals, so for instance, here, this hummingbird uh, to this well, uh, where you see the, you know, the scale is very different. So this is the actual size of the hummingbird compared to the well. Uh, but uh, the skeleton are different, but they're also made in a similar way. And the way they are made in a similar way is because you, it's very visible on the whale. You see that there is this pattern here, this pattern of vertebrae, this metameric uh, pattern, repeated pattern. And so uh, a question you, you might have is how uh, this is happening. How do you have this repeated structure that is really at the basis of the body plan of vertebrates? And so uh, that's, of course, something that people have studied for a long time. Uh, and, uh, and what is really striking is that uh, this metameric pattern, this periodic pattern, really comes from uh, embryonic growth. And so here in the middle, you have a movie of a chicken embryo growing. This is a tail. This is a head. And as you see, as it grows, it's going to form those structures here, uh, those balls sequentially. So those structures are called somites. So if you, the, the movie is looping, so you see it elongates and as it elongates, you form these little balls. And so those little balls will give rise to vertebrae uh, uh, down the road uh, for, for the chick. And so what is very striking is that this, this way of development and formation of segment is, is something very generic to some extent. All vertebrates work like this, but also even in some insects, in some, I mean, actually in most arthropods, you also have this process of growth coupled to segment formation. I will tell you a bit about the genes and everything, but phenomenologically speaking, this is something very generic where you have growth and formation of segments. And so uh, there have been tons of work over the year. I'm going to shortcut to uh, the mid, uh, the mid uh, well, actually not mid, late, uh, late 20s, uh, early 2010s, where people realized, uh, inspired by uh, much work and actually much previous theoretical work, people uh, realized that uh, 
there is uh, the, the, there is an, uh, the periodic pattern, the periodic formation of this uh, sonite is actually controlled by a periodic signal or a clock. And so this is a movie of, those are two movies actually uh, of mass embryos uh, with a reporter. So this is a reporter called Lunatic Fringe. And so this is a, a tale, this is the tale of the mouse embryo. This is another mass embryo here. Uh, growing and 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 this is a, this movie is a bit sl slightly more refined than that movie, but you clearly see that there is uh, basically an oscillation, a wave propagating from here. This is a posterior uh, part of the of the embryo, the tail of the embryo. Uh, the wave propagates from posterior to anterior, and then something is happening here uh, where the wave stops. And then you form segments. So if you look very carefully at this movie, you will see that we, you, you, will, you can see actually the, the, future, uh, the future boundary of vertebrae. So people realize that there was such a clock and that the clock was stopping, basically. Um, so now the question that, you know, how, of course, as theorists, it's very fascinating. Uh, you know, I'm a physicist, so uh, we look at oscillators uh, uh, as an undergrad. Uh, uh, usually we look at harmonic oscillators. So this one cannot be uh, fully or should not be a harmonic oscillator. So how do you, how do you, how do you think about those problems? Uh, so that's very exciting. Um, so uh, now you have to, uh, you know, why is there a wave, how it oscillates? So there is a kind of current, what I call consensus model. Uh, that is, I think, a bit challenged those days, but uh, very recently, at least it was what most people thought uh, um, uh, about the system. So the way it works is that, so you have the embryo that is growing. Uh, in the tail, you do have an oscillation. Uh, and then this oscillation, so what happened at the tail is growing. And so uh, what happens is that as the tail is growing, uh, uh, the, you know, the cell get more and more anterior relative to the tail. And so once at some point, uh, they will get through a threshold of some sort, uh, and uh, and then the the, clo the clock will stop. The oscillation will stop. And it's not quite clear uh, how it stops, but what we know also is that past this threshold here, there will be some kind of pattern. Uh, so it's like the clock, a dynamical clock or dynamical system, uh, temporal oscillation is turned into a kind of frozen or expression or special oscillation. Temporal oscillation giving rise to, to special oscillation. And people generally assume it was under control of a morphogene, like, you know, like think about the, your, your bicoid morphogene, imagine something like this that is moving uh, around and, 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 and defining uh, the stop of the clock. So that's basically the way people are thinking about the system. And to some extent, I'm still thinking about the system, but as I told you, it's a bit challenged those days. So uh, how do you model this as the, uh, a theorist? And so uh, just giving you a bit of historical motivation. So uh, uh, I, I forgot to include a reference to this, but in 1976, there was a model uh, proposed by Cook and Zeman focused on catastrophe theory. That was uh, already predicting already that there is a clock and a way from defining this pattern. Uh, but now if you want to be a bit more, uh, you know, focused on, you know, how those things can work mechanistically, uh, a good way to think about this problem is to really apply this kind of geometric ideas uh, that are started with Waddington. And more recently, they've been becoming a bit more fashionable or, or, or were revived in part by uh, Eric Sidia. And so I was a postdoc with him. So uh, I've been very, very interested in those ideas as well. And so the idea is to really, you know, consider this as kind of geometric problems, looking to study the geometry of the system in, in phase space, basically, or, or, or in latent space, depending on how you call it, and then try to infer some interesting properties uh, from this study. Uh, so that's there is a first historical motivation, but there's also here a biological motivation to do that in the system. And uh, I mean, several biological motivation. So uh, the first uh, biological motivation is that uh, it, what I, what I you know, it's kind of a joke, but it's really a mess in the sense that if you compare different species, different, you know, even within the spe given species, it's really not clear what happens. So uh, one of the problems that there are many, many genes that are oscillating. And so it's really not clear at all, you know, is there a core oscillator? Is there, are there maybe two oscillators? You know, like all of this is really unclear. Uh, it's very difficult to figure out. And what is really, really fascinating as well, and that should really like from a theoretical standpoint, uh, th there is really a deep question there, which is the fact that if you compare different species, you will still see this process of oscillations and waves and formation of the vertebrae, but the genes implicated are different. 
I mean, there are overlaps, of course. Uh, there are some genes uh, that are really common, like for instance, uh, some pathways are common, but some genes that oscillate in the species that, and are very important for one species will not oscillate in another one, for instance. So there is a kind of very, very clear here that they call in this paper evolutionary plasticity of the, of, of what the, the segmentation clock of this oscillator. And that motivates a view that is a bit more abstract and a bit less gene focused, like, like, like trying to understand what is really conserved there in the system. It cannot be at the gene level. It's more at the dynamical system level that is conserved and that motivates a study that is a much more focused on the dynamical system level to some extent. So second reason why uh, it's also uh, interesting and that's a bit the same, uh, you know, along the same, uh, the same reason, the same, the same, uh, the, 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 the same way, uh, it's because there is probably a convergent evolution uh, of the segmentation process. So for instance, if you look at insects, uh, you also see a segmentation clock. And it's very likely that the common ancestor of vertebrates and of uh, insects uh, did not have a segmentation clock. So it means that evolution was able to rediscover uh, the same process and, and the same kind of dynamical system uh, independently. And so that also motivates uh, a study that is much more you know, geometric in spirit because it means that there are some kind of uh, very, very deep uh, properties that are select, discovered by evolution several times and maybe you yourself could discover it and study it and then use that to study the actual system. And so uh, this raises also tons of theoretical questions. So as a theory, the first time I, I, I I made this problem is that, you know, like very basic question that were not still clear to me. So for instance, how does the clock stop? Uh, and uh, why at the same time generating a pattern? And what does that even mean? What does a clock stopping mean? You know, is it like, uh, you know, a, a pendulum that is just stopping or is it that the clock is dying? So what does that even mean? And how would you test that exponentially? Uh, the second question also is that, of course, what kind of, you know, gene networks uh, would explain this behavior, but I would like to take today a more geometric uh, uh, view, although I could tell you a bit more about the, the gene networks doing this as well. Of course, how can such a mechanism evolve? And I, I added a, a last question a bit as a, as a provocation to some extent, like do, do genes matter here in the sense that is it really the, what is the right level to study this problem? And I, I already told you, probably the right level is not really at the gene level. It's more, maybe at a higher, uh, at, at a higher level, uh, basically, uh, that we can study this. And so uh, I'm going to tell you a few things we've done on this problem. And so uh, the first thing we've done is actually, so this is something that uh, related to stuff I actually studied a long time ago during my PhD. Uh, it turns out that during my PhD, I designed uh, tools to actually study evolution of networks and to model evolution of networks performing specific functions. And so this problem of, um, of, uh, of segmentation was actually ideal to study this, to, 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 to this algorithm. So it, it's, it's really, a, so here it's really an example of a simulation. The idea is that it's just an evolutionary algorithm that is going to grow a network and add genes, remove genes randomly. And you want to select for some specific behaviors. I don't want to spend too much time on this because uh, it, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's, it's really a big part of my work, of, of my, my past work. And I want to focus on more recent Stuff, but we have you know tons of papers uh, where we, we publish this method. And uh, here, the interesting thing here is that this method gave an interesting result uh, that I will be uh, elaborating on uh, next. Uh, so uh, this is a, a result of uh, this evolutionary computation that we did. So this is a model that is generated by your by your computer. And so uh, here you have a movie just showing you how this model is behaving. And so clearly you see that there is an oscillation, and then this oscillation is con under control of a morphogene. So very similar to the kind of model I, I told you, the kind of you know, idea that people have about the system. And then this gives a pattern. So this, this model is a very simple model that even the computer really has the right ingredient uh, similar to what we see in experiments. But the beauty of this model is that it evolves without any strong constraints. So what we were selecting here uh, in, this, uh, in this simulation, sorry, is for patterns to form. So we did not select for a clock or for anything. We just wanted to see what kind of networks can give patterns. 
And uh, when you do this, you really have this very nice combination of oscillator controlling stripes sequentially that is appearing during this uh, evolutionary estimation. And so we found that very, very interesting because it means that, you know, I was telling you there must be something deep about uh, how these things can evolve several times uh, that, uh, the, and we, we basically see something similar at the computer. Uh, the, the message uh, in terms of dynamical system that we get from that and the real prediction we get from that is, is, a, is the next slide actually. So when we did the simulation, we saw many, many networks behaving the same way, but the common features of those networks, the, the network topologies were different, uh, the genes were different, but the common feature uh, uh, between all the network that evolved is essentially a bifurcation diagram. And so uh, I tried at that time, if it, uh, it's almost 10 years ago, to draw what the bifurcation diagram should look like. And, uh, and you basically need a three dimension. Uh, and so what you have is that you have a kind of par control parameter that I'm calling M like a morphogene. On one side of this control parameter, you're going to have uh, a cycle, an oscillation. And then uh, when this morphogene is going to be zero, essentially, you're going to have pattern formation. And so we assume this pattern formation is related to what is called rostral caudal polarity within the, within the segment. And so it's basically a bistable system. And so now the question is, how do you go from an oscillation to a bistable system? And if you think about it, you know, if you try to write a simple model of this, and, and this is the thing that is happening here is that you have you need to have two bifurcations uh, a priori that was our idea you would have some maybe a half bifurcation here at some point the oscillator will die and then you need to have a sardonal bifurcation to get uh, a bistable system and so now if you move rapidly from this system to this system so if you cross this bifurcation rapidly what you will end up with is a system where the phase of the clock is kind of binarized and encoded into the two phase, uh, two pattern, two two states of the system, which is what it explains why you have those stripes uh, that are emerging in the in 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 the system. So that was a bit our idea, our initial idea about this problem, like uh, roughly ten years ago. So now, uh, one thing that puzzled me is that there were other models uh, uh, around, and so in particular, an alternative scenario was proposed by Julian Lewis, who is a very prominent. Uh, 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 I would say biophysicist because he was both doing mostly biology, biological experiments, but he was also doing uh, a bit of modeling. And so he suggested that the way the clock stop is rather through an infinite period transition. So his idea was the following. So you have the clock and the clock has to stop. Uh, and then the way it stops is that it's basically the frequency the, 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 the frequency uh, is going to zero. So you oscillate and then your frequency is going to zero or the period is going to infinity. And then kind of once your period is, go, is to infinity, you're going to freeze the phase of your system. It's more like a frozen system. It's, it's like something cooling down uh, and getting frozen. And so now what you have is that if you have a front going through this a system like this, uh, you would have a temporal oscillation that is essentially frozen into a spatial oscillation. And so I was curious to see, you know, this model are kind of reasonable too. So if you look at the, at the data, you, you, you know, you see things that look a bit like this. And so I was wondering, like, is there a way to somehow combine the two models or to study the two models or to reunite the two models? And so uh, that's basically uh, what we did. We figure out a way to somehow, under the same formalism, describe the two models. And so this is a paper we published uh, a few, uh, last year in eLife. Uh, and it turns out that if you use geometric models, uh, and I'm going to, to define in one second what I mean by geometric models, you can really uh, solve the problem and essentially get the two models as two, two different instances of the same, uh, the same, the, the same process. And so uh, the motivation for this model actually comes from something uh, that is known now in insect development and not so much in vertebrate development. And so the idea in insect development is that people realize that uh, insects, just like vertebrate, they have kind of uh, different phases of development. Uh, and, and, the different, uh, and the different phases are kind of characterized by uh, basically a dynamic phase and a static phase. So for instance, uh, if you look, so this is, if you're familiar with, I don't know if you're familiar with the gap genes expression, but if you look at gap genes expression during uh, fly segmentation, uh, you will get a wave of gap genes in, in, within the embryo and the wave is stabilized. And so those two, uh, those two phases, the wave propagation and then the stabilization of the wave are actually controlled by different sets of enhancers. And so the suggestion here 
is that uh, the reason why you have a dynamical system first and then uh, something that is stabilized first, it's simply just two different genetic programs controlled by different uh, enhancers, basically. And so uh, that motivates for us a study of the process uh, of segmentation where we hypothesis, uh, we, our hypothesis basically is that something similar, very similar is happening uh, in vertebrate segmentation where you have two sets of enhancers one set of enhancer that is basically going to drive an oscillator in the tail, and one set of enhancer that is going to drive you know, pattern formation, uh, stabilization uh, in, in, the, in the head of the embryo. And so uh, now th th this becomes essentially a, a boundary conditions problem where you're going to say, you know, the dynamical system is behaving one way here and the other way uh, here. And then we just need to match those two behaviors and see what is happening in the middle. So in terms of equation, this is kind of abstract equation of the system. You're going to say you have an ensemble of genes, so a vector P. Uh, and so you're going to have a set of static enhancer uh, that, is, that are activated in the, head of the, in, the, in the head of the embryo, and then a set, a, a set of uh, dynamical enhancer activated in the tail of the embryo. And basically you move smoothly from one to the other. And so now what you can do is that you can make a, a simple model of what happens here and there. And so you could say, uh, you know, oops, you could say, uh, on the right, you get basically get the limit cycle uh, and this very simple geometry like this using, I don't know, a kind of Poincaré oscillator. You can basically use pretty much any kind of oscillator you want. Uh, and then on the left, you're going to say you have a bistable system. And now the question is that you're going to see how you transition from this dynamical system to that dynamical system and try to explore a bit what kind of properties you, you, you can get when you do this. And so we did exactly this. Uh, with all kind of models, geometric models, HD network, we really said, you know, we really said, we know this is oscillating here. We know this is going to be multi-stable here. We want to study how you can transition from one to the other with different uh, scenarios uh, of transition. And so to make a long story short, when we did that, we find two broad scenarios. I'm going to show you those two broad scenarios now. The first scenario is basically the one that evolved in my computer first. So here it's just to show you the attractors of the dynamics as you vary a parameter G, which is going to drive the transition from this oscillation to this multi-stability. And so in this first scenario, uh, so I'm going to show you again, maybe the movie. So you start with a cycle, the cycle is collapsing because it's of bifurcation. And then later on, uh, you're going to have, here's a pitchfork bifurcation because I put symmetric parameters, but you can make them asymmetric to get a saddle node bifurcation. But basically you get this kind of geometry that this is very similar to the one that we've on the computer. So again, you know, the idea is to explore a bit what kind of transition you can have. And, and, and that's one of the transitions. So we did that in different way, but uh, in those first scenario is something like this. Now, more maybe more interestingly uh, or more unexpectedly, we actually observe a second scenario, which is the following. So in this scenario, and this is a scenario when you have a very, very, very smooth linear transition from one set of enhancer to the other. In this scenario, what happened that the, the, the limit cycle is deforming and the way it's going to work, so those are arranged in your lines and in the clients, the way it's going to disappear is through actually a sneak, saddle so node in cycle bifurcation. Um, and so, uh, and then at the very end, you get also the bistability. So here again, it's a symmetrical case, but it could also work if the thing is asymmetrical. Uh, it also works very well. So a, a very a different way. So instead of having the cycle collapsing, the cycle is deformed, and then you get a sneak bifurcation. Uh, a fixed point is appearing on the cycle, and one of those fixed points is actually giving you a future fate of the embryo. So this scenario was quite interesting. I know it was kind of unexpected to us. Uh, it, actually, now in retrospect, it's, it, I guess it's, 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 it's kind of evident, but uh, I did not expect it when, when it first happened. And so now what is really interesting is that this scenario actually explained a lot, uh, a lot of things that we see in the experiment. So for instance, this scenario, since there's a sneak, you get an infinite period. And so the infinite period is very similar to uh, basically this uh, Julian Lewis model, model proposal that the system should go to a zero frequency infinite period. So now how would you test a model like this? So uh, an interesting observation is to look at what, what is a wave pattern for different scenarios. So here I'm going to show you a movie and each of the movie is a scenario where you get from an oscillating system to basically a, a patterned uh, system. And you will see that the wave patterns are very similar, but there are subtleties and there are differences. So for instance, 
if you look at the Hoff model, you basically get something fuzzy on both sides as the, as the pattern uh, is forming, and then it's going to basically give you refine to a more uh, to a more discrete pattern to a more uh, sharp to a sharper pattern. Now, if you look at the sneak model, you get something very very different. You get uh, one side is sharp and one sharp side is shallow. So here, for instance, one this this side is sharper than this side. This size of the pattern is sharper and, uh, than this size of the pattern. So when you look at, so, so really when you look at these different geometries, the different bifurcations pattern, what you expect is that you're going to have different shapes of the wave propagating in the embryo. And then of course, that's something you can test and you can shape. And so it turns out that, uh, so I'm also doing, I also did a lot of data analysis to really understand uh, how these waves are propagating. So this is from work uh, uh, almost uh, you know, started 10 years ago. We actually see this asymmetry in the wave propagation. Uh, when you look, those are data from ZebraFish. I won't comment on, on it ex exact, I mean, in details, but you really see this idea that you have a wave that is asymmetric, like very, very sharp on one side and very shallow on the other side. So we think it's, a, it's, it's very consistent with the sneak bifurcation. Uh, and also uh, with this infinite period scenario uh, that, that we expect in, in, this, in, in this new bifurcation scenario. So we, we believe this, is this could be the right bifurcation. So now there are other, other things you can check. So for instance, this scenario is actually much more robust to many, many things. So things like parameter changes, uh, a shadow gradient, uh, you can do a lot with this model and you see that it's much more robust than the hub system. Uh, also, uh, you could, an interesting thing is that, and maybe a potential confirmation of this model uh, is that uh, you can look at different animals. And, and for instance, you can look at mouse. Uh, and it turns out that if you look at the wind mutant of mouse, uh, the mouse will look much more like a zebra fish. And what is really interesting in the mouse, in the wind mutant for mouse, is that you see much more clearly this kind of asymmetry in the way that I'm describing that we also see in the SNP model. Uh, and so that suggests to me that uh, uh, you know this kind of model where you're really discussing the bifurcation, uh, they can actually be predictive of what happens in evolution and potentially of some kind of developmental evolutionary plasticity. So that's something we're still exploring on, but it turns out that the sneak like model that we described seems to be much more plastic to tons of, uh, of variation you can do on the system. And so maybe this is the reason why uh, it's more systematic, it, it, it's, it's, might have been the one selected by evolution. And so I'm going to somehow conclude this first part of my talk on development to tell you that, uh, you know, if you think about this uh, problem of development, evolutionary uh, evolution in the simulate in the computer naturally gets you this bistable plus oscillator uh, solution. But then if you look at more in detail, the way you translate from bistability to an oscillating system, uh, you actually get two kinds of scenarios. And in particular, you get the sneak scenario. And the sneak scenario somehow looks more consistent with the data. And that's something that uh, was quite interesting because that really came from uh, the pure theoretical analysis and we were able to recover some, somehow for free uh, interesting properties that we see in actual embryos. And in particular, I'm really curious about wind mutant now to see uh, if we can explore more this next scenario. So uh, that's it for development. So uh, I'm going to uh, switch gears a little bit. Uh, um, I understand I get questions at the end, so I'm, I'm immediately going to move on. And uh, I'm going to tell you about a bit more, a bit about something that is somehow completely different, uh, in, both in terms of biology and maybe in terms of spirit. But you will see in the end, uh, hopefully, that there are some con interesting commonalities which are related to uh, immunology. So, okay, so immunology. So uh, I got interested into immunology for various reasons. Uh, one aspect I got interested in is what we call cytokine dynamics. So you might have heard about cytokine dynamics recently uh, because uh, this is a big problem, for instance, in COVID, where there's this so-called cytokine release syndrome, and that's also something uh, in immunotherapy. So what are cytokines? Cytokines are ways that T cells or immune cells are communic communicating with one another. And so it turns out that the cytokine concentration are very, very dynamic. So for instance, this is the construction as a function of time of a cytokine called IL-2. And so you see it's going to go up, go down, uh, but sometimes it does not go down. It depends on, uh, on the antigen uh, co uh, concentration. Uh, if you vary the number of T cells, also the dynamics is going to be different. You're going to have different timescales. 
So this is something that dynamic and it's not quite clear how these cytokines are working. Also, I want to point out one thing. Uh, the time here is very, very long. So here we are really talking about time scale of weeks. So uh, if you think about segmentation clock, I was telling you about one cycle of segmentation clock uh, is basically two hours in mouse. So here we really have like way different time scales. So it's not easy to make movies and all of that. So that's part of the problem actually. Uh, so uh, what we did, is that we were interested in this problem of cytokine dynamics. And so uh, this is a collaboration with Grégoire Alton Bonnet at NIH. And so what Grégoire designed is a robot that is able to basically monitor uh, in vitro an immune response and monitor cytokine response for weeks, uh, not weeks, days, sorry, days, days, not weeks. Um, so, uh, and so what we what he did is that we put T cells, we put different antigens and we're simply monitoring the properties and the dynamic of cytokines. And the idea is to try to find a kind of model of what is happening here. And I tell you how we did that. And so, uh, you know, I mean, I won't go too much to the experimental detail, but you basically, you put T cells with antigens and then you see what is happening and you have tons of markers and we will focus on cytokines today, but we can have uh, uh, other markers as well. Okay, so now what is the problem? Uh, the problem is that when you put a T cell in presence of antigen, uh, the antigen will have different strengths. And so here it's called quality. And so it's well known that uh, the, the response, the immune response is depending on the antigen quality. And so this antigen quality, is typically, it's related to a biochemical parameter such as the affinity of, uh, of, uh, of the antigen to the receptor of the T cells, for instance. Um, so uh, it's an important problem because it's known that for instance, success of immunotherapy is really related to the antigen quality, to the antigen strength. So you want T cells that are able to really nicely bind uh, tumors. Uh, and so it's really important to be able to, to figure out this, uh, what, what the antigen quality is. And so what we did is that we put in this robot antigens with different quality, with T cells, and then we just watch what happens, like what kind of cytokine response we had. And so this is the kind of data that we had. Uh, and so and this is what I mean by data driven, like we have those data, tons of data like that. And so uh, let me walk you through a little bit the kind of data that those are. So from right uh, to left, it's basically stronger antigen. So this is weak an antigen, and this is a very strong antigen. So different column, the different lines, sorry, are different cytokines. So this is a cytokine that is called interferon gamma. This is a cytokine called IL-2, this is IL-6, IL-17, TNF-alpha. Now the different curves, are different uh, modalities of the system, for instance, different number of T cells, and also different concentration of the antigen. So we basically have this kind of relatively complex space where we can vary the parameter of the immune response, you know, the antigen, the concentration, the number of T cells, monitor different cytokines. And uh, the question is that how do you deal with this mess? Like, how do you, how do you model this? Uh, how, how do you deal with that? And the important thing uh, that will come, that will be relevant later is that it's, we can do this reproducibly because we have a robot. And so we can redo these experiments or do them in parallel many, many times. And so we can get really things like nice error bars or, or really nice precise, uh, precise statistics essentially on the data. Uh, and that will allow us to really do something relatively sophisticated later on. So, the question that how do you know how do you deal with those data how can you as a, as a physicist how can i model this and so uh so you know we thought about this for a long time uh, and then we came up with a solution and again the solution is to relate to something that is low dimension and essentially finding a low dimensional representation of the system so the first thing we did uh, that realized through different means is that uh, if you plot, for instance, the, the cytokine, uh, cytokines as a function of one another for different antigen, antigens, you get nice, you start having nice curves. And these curves are, look like they are on the same kind of manifold, basically. But the problem is that these curves, they cross, so it's complicated to deal with. Now, what we realize is that if we take actually the integral of those curves, uh, things are getting much nicer. And so this, I want to relate this to my first slide where I will tell you about Elliot centrism versus Geon centrism. Like just finding the right variables or the right quantity to integrate for analyzing the model is actually crucial. And a crucial step had been for us to take integral of logs uh, to, to understand uh, the dynamics. So uh, we found it in different ways. There, it, it sounds like black magic, but there was some rational why we consider it. I just don't have time to, to explain to you uh, in details. 
So then the second step that we did is that once we have this nice dynamic, we try to train a neural network to essentially classify based on the cytokine dynamics, the, 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 the quality of the antigen. So those names here are just names of antigens. So this is weak antigen, this is a strong antigen. Uh, this is in my cells, if you, if you wonder. And so the thing we did is that we did a neural network, but we did a special neural network. We wanted that in the middle, there are only two nodes. And the reason why we wanted two nodes is because if you have only two nodes in your network, you can then project that in 2D and see how our system works. And so that's the next slide. This is a 2D projection of a train neural network where you see uh, in this so-called latent space, this two-dimensional space, the dynamics of uh, cytokine response, the dynamic of immune response. And what you clearly see here visually immediately is that those different colors correspond to different antigen quality. And you see you have a relatively nice separation. So our projection does a very good job of uh, separating antigen based uh, on, uh, on quality. Uh, and describing the data purely based on strength of the antigen. So that was uh, a good first step because you know, this complicated data, we can reduce it to this 2D uh, representation and we get something nice that we might hopefully analyze. So now this is where I put my theoretical physicist at. When I see curves like this, I want to model them. And so what we did, the next step was to model the dynamics in the so-called latent space. And so it's actually, quite easy to do because uh, once you have these curves, it really looks like ro literal rocket science in the sense that you could you have these phases where uh, you know the, 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 the thing is kind of going straight and then tapering down. And so what you can do is that you can just use simple ballistic equations to actually parameterize those curves. And so a priori, so we did that, we have all these curves, we parameterize them. Uh, and then a priori, we have basically four parameters per curve. And then we can try to study what is the space, possible space of those curves. You know, how can we vary those parameters? What can we do with those parameters? And so uh, now this is where things become really interesting because when we study the parameters of the different curves, again, those curves are projection of cytokines uh, dynamics on 2D. Uh, and so we parameterize those curves with four parameters, but then it turns out that those four parameters are actually highly correlated. Uh, in fact, there is only one effective parameter. So this is really what you see here. So this is, these are matrix of one parameter expressed as the other parameter. And you see those are really, I mean, those are lines basically. Uh, you clearly see it. And so that means that there is only one effective parameter controlling everything. And so those, those curves that, you know, were already, you know, we had this complicated cytokine, uh, you know, many, many cytokines, we project them on 2D. Uh, to get simpler curve, but those curves are actually very simple, but they are parameterized by only one parameter. And of course, this parameter is going to be related to antigen strengths. And so once you realize this, there are many, many things that you can do. And so I'm going to tell to show you a few things that you can do with this very simple modeling. So the first thing you can do that you can try to predict antigen strengths, antigen strengths, antigen quality based on this projection of cytokine dynamics. So for instance, here, uh, this, uh, this pink and this gray uh, antigen uh, were given, were not used in the training, but what we can do is that we can correlate the fitted parameter of, uh, of this and correlate this to the EC50. So EC50 is going to be a measure of the strength of the antigen. And so uh, the circle are the training data and the cross are test data. So you see there is a very, very nice linear uh, connection and this, this data, this, this antigen that were not used in the training data that project very nicely uh, on everything else. So that works very well. So it's useful because that means that if you don't know uh, a priori the antigen strengths of uh, the antigen quality of, of uh, you know, a tumor or something, you can put them in our system and then just get an actual number very easily, purely based on the cytokine dynamics. And, so, and there are advantages for this because cytokine dynamics are going to be more robust and stuff like that. So, so this is something we can do. So now the second thing we can do is that, uh, so I told you we have this model in 2D. Uh, but then uh, in latent space, but then the question you might wonder is that how much information does that contain about the entire space of response and the all cytokine that we're considered. And so what we did is that we found a way to use this 2D projection to actually go back to the full cytokine space. And, and it's basically just a simple machine learning problem. You can train a decoder going from 2D to 5, 6, 7D, all cytokines. And so this is just to show you uh, what kind of thing we can do. So uh, actual data are going to be uh, the dots here. Uh, and then 
the, our model, reconstructing model, uh, are going to be those lines. And so the lines that you see here, they're not interpolation. They are not. Uh, they are not uh, average of data. They are synthetic data. They are fake data. But the statistical properties of the data are, uh, of of the data are, are chosen in latent space so that they match. Uh, the actual experiments. And so, uh, and you see it works very, very well. So that basically gives you a simple model from this 2D model, you can get a simple model of all cytokine behavior and then study this. So we use that to do different things. So I'm going to move a bit, uh, just, just wrap up rapidly now. Uh, so one thing we did, we did a bit of information theory. So once we have this generative model, you can try to ask questions like, you know, what kind of noise are there in the data? Uh, what kind of actual classes of antigen there are? How many antigens you can separate? And so a naive thing would be to tell that, you know, there is only self versus not self. This would be a binary response that will give you one bit of information. Now we can use this generative model, quantify the noise and find out how many categories, effective categories, and then uh, uh, the system, the immune system can distinguish. And so we found basically uh, five classes or 2.3 bits. Uh, so that means that actually this cytokine system uh, is actually able to basically five classes, you know, di distinguish between many, many categories. It's, not, it's, it's really like you have different levels of uh, immune activation and that is relevant because uh, depending in, in which category of immune activation you are, you might have different, different and you might be in trouble on. I'm going to skip that, but we can actually tell something about the actual biochemical mechanism just by looking at the neural network. Uh, now, one last thing that is really, really cool is that everything I've shown you so far, it's on mouse cells. And so we can do this latent space modeling and everything on mouse cell. But what we can do is that we can also look, take actual model and look at human cells and see if it works the same way. And actually it works beautifully. The human cells are going to have the same property. You're going to see the same kind of, uh, 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 of, uh, of pro proportionality, linear relation between this V0 parameter defined in latent space and the EC50, which is the strength of the antigen. And so we're playing with that a lot. I'm going to wrap up, uh, I, I'm almost done. Um, the last thing I wanted to show you, but I don't have time is that we're actually exploring the, the effect of drugs on this latent space. And we can select for good drugs for uh, different uh, immune uh, response. So we can generate new uh, immune response that are not natural by playing on drugs and by studying what happens in latent space. Again, the strength here that we have a, a complicated high dimensional uh, data set, but projecting into 2D allows you to do a lot and to quantify a lot of interesting properties of the system. And so I'm going to wrap here and to wrap the talk. Uh, so the point of, the, of this is to show you that, you know, you can take really high dimensional data, but being high throughput, and then having a kind of, you know, supervised approach to actually get a 2D model. And then once you're in 2D, once you're in latent space, there's a lot that you can do. And uh, there, are, there are a lot of interesting features that you can study, such as, you know, the number of cat, oops, sorry, that's my, I'm going to, I'm going to, 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 to stop this. Uh, you can do, uh, you can do evaluation of antigen strengths. Uh, you can actually test different things. So test different immunotherapeutic strategies. And this is something that we are doing now using this latent space as a theoretical tool derived from data uh, to study this. And with this, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I have many collaborators on this, uh, uh, Alexandre Olela, Olivier Pourquier, uh, Sharon Amacher, is that El Sherry from the segmentation part, Grégoire Altambonnet on the immune part, uh, and, my, and thank my students, Laurent Victoria on the segmentation part, and Thomas and Francois uh, on the immune part. I just wanted to show you McGill, uh, three seasons, we don't really have four seasons, I would say three seasons, uh, and uh, thanks a lot for uh, your attention.